so we can put this on the, the web for anyone that misses it. So it's Small Business Month and uh, quickly may I say, uh, can I acknowledge our traditional owners uh, of, of our lands in which we come from, from my land, I say Warami, which is welcome in Darug language, and pay my respects to all elders past, present um, and emerging and, uh, and hope we learn from them about how they've cared for the land over these many, many years and we respect um, their traditions and take them forward and educate others in those. So as I say, it's Small Business Month and I'm real quickly just jump to this one, which is the sessions that we've organised in partnership with the state government. Um, and uh, also Snowy Monaro Regional Council have been great in supporting this. So if you haven't um, registered for these, please do so because the numbers are limited and I want to make sure that you guys certainly get access to these, these great speakers. Um, just quickly, they're, they're, uh, the themes are, are set by the government in future proofing, digital age, uh, research plan and do. So we've made um, our content very outdoor uh, specific, but uh, in line with the themes that they have suggested. So you can see that first one, uh, Paul Wade, for those that are as old as I am, you will remember um, his magnificent triumphs as ex uh, Socceroo captain. And, um, and he has had an amazing uh, journey and I won't give away any secrets. I'll let him give those away on the 7th of October. And I think we can learn a lot from his, his way he, that he has um, set his mindset into his business and, and encouraged others. Um, the second one is Dave Power, who comes to you with immense knowledge in marketing um, and certainly gives us some insight into uh, what works in a digital space. So if you're conscious about your marketing and, and need some more information uh, there, make sure you register for Dave's session. Um, Stephen is an economic development professional and he spends his life meeting with small businesses one-on-one -on -one every day of the, of the year and helping them and guiding them with tools that are readily accessible which most people really don't understand that are at their fingertips and uh, what Stephen's about is making sure that uh, businesses have access to content to make informed decisions so he will take us through <clears throat> some of those um, uh, tips and hints and where you can find that information in that session. By the way, all of these are at 9am, so you don't have to try to remember multiple timeframes. Uh, they're all 9am on, uh, on those dates. And the last one, which I'm, I'm most excited about, I was lucky enough to connect with Dan over the lockdown of... Um, of COVID and one company that has always been uh, a pinnacle of um, greatness in my mind has been the Disney Group and um, I certainly connected with uh, past executives over the years and, and Dan I reached out to uh, in lockdown and he had some great sessions where um, he had a group of like 10 people and we were meeting at 3am in the morning as I did, I <laughs> got up at 3am to, to have those discussions. But uh, look, what he brings to um, the understanding of business and leadership is second to none. So I'm so excited that he said, <clears throat> he said yes to coming along to our last session. So if you don't get to any of the others, get to that one. I think you'll be blown away. So please register. As I say, there are limited numbers because I can't afford a huge uh, a Zoom fee, but uh, make sure you jump in and, and grab your tickets to those. Now, let me just go quickly go back. Now, what I wanted to just articulate today, which I think most of you um, on the line from what I can see are members, but I just want to reiterate the structure of Outdoors New South Wales and ACT. And we are supported by the Office of Sport in New South Wales, which means that you have access to myself and to Leslie, and that's, um, that's awesome that, that we get that support. Where the membership dollars comes in is to capacity and delivery of products and programs that we can um, help facilitate for our members. So membership is a really important and crucial element to our business plan and things like the mentoring program and um, the small business workshops, all of that type of uh, um, content that we can deliver our members has to be funded by other means. So um, yeah, if, if you know people that aren't members, I really encourage you to certainly reach out and say, come on board. The power of the voice is really important in a peak body. Um, and we've still got our pandemic policy, which means anyone can join at no cost up to the 30th of November. Um, and if you want to go onto the payment plan, we've got that available now for you as well. 
So just going on to the week in review, I've spoken to a lot of you um, this week around COVID plans and just some clarification. Um, and yes, apologies, it was probably my fault for putting the newsletter um, and recommending the Queensland plan because um, a lot of you went, oh, cool, we can do two square metres. <laughs> no, 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 it's four square metres in New South Wales and ACT still. So apologies for that. And I think I clarified that in the members newsletter and in some discussions with you. Um, um, I also clarified the social distancing and, and what actually is required in that. Um, as I articulated in the member newsletter, legally we have to comply by the four square metre rule. That is the thing that you will be fined for if you don't comply with that. Um, social distancing when the 1.5 metres is encouraged wherever physically possible. And certainly, as I said last week, it's really important as a sector that we do as much as we can to ensure that we are preventing um, transmission and clusters appearing in your businesses in our industry for the sake of not only your business and our industry but the state and potentially nationally as well so please do what you can to prevent a COVID transmission mentoring program I am so excited by how many responses we got we still would love some more under 25s um, I, I just think it's fabulous that all of you are so keen to also mentor. So uh, really great results and uh, fingers crossed we do get this grant over the line because it'll be a fabulous program. Um, but if you know anyone that's under 25 that wants to jump like Stuart's son um, into, into the sector, uh, please give them that link and, and make sure that they register for that because this is at no cost to them and uh, wow, what a magnificent opportunity for, for young people to jump into a mentoring program. Uh, a reminder on the camp pricing review, and um, I, I've received a lot, which is great. Um, so if you haven't um, submitted your pricing to me, please do so, because as I said, if you do submit your pricing to me to um, add into the content of the report, then you will get a copy of that report um, when I've completed it. So if you if you wouldn't mind just um, dropping me an email with your, your pricing, as I said, it's all confidential. I'll be removing any names to protect all the innocents and, uh, and just providing a report in a generic style. Um, outdoor Economic Conference, speaking of getting up at 3 a.m. to meet Dan Cockrell, um, the Outdoor Economic Conference um, is being held at the moment in the States. You remember um, seeing um, the presentation from last week on what's happening over there. Really interesting discussion items. Um, I've been on chat with a lot of them um, over there and what I want to do is summarise some of that content and bring it to you in future sessions. But it's it's been really interesting to see the trends are no different over there to what they are here, and particularly in the staffing and uh, and keeping people within the sector. So uh, really great information. So I encourage you if you haven't um, jumped on and and looked at that, uh, then their app is incredible. <laughs> They've got uh, an app where you can engage one on one and the questions and view all the recordings and everything. And and certainly I'll be taking some of that learning for our own NOAC conference or, or rather. Um, scams, I think a lot of you got the email this week uh, about selling the database to the Outdoors New South Wales Symposium, uh, which was meant to be in Fairmont Resort Lure. Not only did they get the name wrong, but they got the dates wrong. Um, look, it, it was a scam, so please um, don't respond. However, just letting you know, I did respond because I was intrigued to find out uh, what they were going to sell me. And uh, I actually spoke to them in the United States. It's a legitimate business to business um, company. So they've had uh, people obviously scanning the internet and trying to pull, pull things left, right and center from there. So I uh, voiced my concern considering that the, the event didn't go ahead and he must have an inaccurate database. So they informed me that they'll be pulling that database from the, uh, from the, the selling <laughs> also. So who knows, but anyway, uh, there's a scam for you that's uh, certainly potential to capture a lot of uh, suspecting people, which is not, not fun. Subcommittee update. We had two meetings this week for our subcommittees. Uh, the Risk Management and Incident Response Committee uh, met again. And uh, I'm really excited by some of the conversations that these guys are having and what tools that they're looking at that can be accessed by the outdoor sector. Um, they've connected with Dr. Claire uh, Dallas, who uh, is uh, he's very experienced in this area. And, um, and that was a great conversation about some of the things that we don't need to reinvent the wheel on that's happening 
happened in the past, but uh, certainly some of the tools that they're looking at, you'll, you'll certainly find very useful and this, this committee will be great for all our members. The Trial Bike Committee also met this week um, to understand a little bit about what they're trying to achieve in this space. One thing I just wanted to highlight with this group is the significant size and value of this um, activity, particularly in New South Wales. Um, and we had uh, some responses from um, 2,400 people that are active trail bike riders that you know, injected their comments and um, issues into a survey. In future meetings, I'd love to share that with you, but uh, at this stage, it's just information for the committee, but it's, it's quite um, impactful as, as in economic terms, but also mental health terms, which is a majority of why people um, activate in this, um, in this activity. Mm. So uh, there's a quick review for you. Oops, I just went backwards. And uh, what I thought I might do quickly is just ask you a few questions in leading to the next topic. And um, this is around, now let me just relaunch this. You should be able to see that now. I just want to know from everyone online, have you attended the National Outdoor Education Conference? I think it's been running for some, geez, Dom, is it about 10 years? No, more, 18 years, something like that. I think it's about 20. It's a long time, Laurie. Um, it's been a long yeah, time. It's been, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I just want to get a bit of a gauge from everyone. Have they attended in, in past years? I've put an option there. Can't remember, so it must not have been much of an impact to me. But if you, if you have or you haven't, uh, really, really keen to um, understand from our stakeholders, um, if you have or haven't. Leslie, you're going to have to guide me on how many people have, um, have responded because I can't see it on my end for some reason. It's one of those. Okay, we're still going, I think. So another few seconds. Wonderful. Um, Thank so, you. Yeah. Jump on, everyone. Everyone can just respond to that one and then I'll end it. Okay, I think we're getting now. Uh... Yep, great. And if I now share the results, can you tell me the results? Yes, 50% for yes, 50% for no. Okay, all right. That's good. All right, I didn't realise yeah. there were so many. So thank you, everyone. Really, really good to, to know. Now, just on that, could you tell me if you were to attend a NOAC conference in the, in the next 12 months or another conference, it doesn't have to be NOAC, any conference in the next 12 months, what would be the main factor that would motivate you to, to attend? Would it be new information and ways to help what you do every day? Is it networking opportunities? Is it the food? <laughs> That's me. Uh, <laughs> chance to get away from work uh, and home <laughs> if you're working from home. Uh, hear great inspirational speakers. Don't know. Could be the title of the event, not too sure. Uh, and don't want to attend anything that will take me away from my work because I'm so committed to it every, every day of the year. <laughs> so let me know um, what would really motivate you in, uh, in attending a conference. As I say, it doesn't have to be NOAC, um, just any conference because it'll help me in understanding, um, yeah, a little bit more about the motivations behind, because New South Wales is the next host for NOAC, if you remember, and we're just trying to work out what's going to be best for our stakeholders as we formulate this. How are we going there, Leslie? Yeah, still going. I think people are probably just reading through. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> lock, getting lock there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, you can probably end the poll then, Laurie. Okay, great. Yeah, Mel, I think uh, a lot of peak bodies um, sometimes do their own events and uh, NOAC is every two years. Um, so it was meant to be right now. We're meant to be in Lura today. <laughs> uh, this is the last day of the event, I think. Uh, what were the results there, Lisa? Yeah, um, so new information and ways to help my position were sort of the most outstanding okay. um, that people want. And right. then it's networking opportunities and, and, and then inspirational speakers there. So everything else was okay. yeah. just, yeah, mainly new information, new ways of doing things. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you for that. 
And thanks everyone for contributing to that. It's a really, um, really good information. As I say, it's, it's crucial to get a bit of a, a handle on what's going to work. And if I can get you to either take a picky of this or a scan of this and, and do it at a later time, this is the survey that I'm about to send out today on NOEC to everyone. It's a three minute survey. So it's not onerous, but it certainly drills into a little bit more content than, than our poll ju just did. And uh, it, gives, it gives us a little bit of an understanding, particularly about um, hybrid events. And I don't know how many people have, have participated in hybrid events uh, of late, which is uh, in person and online. But I participated one this week, actually, that was in New Zealand. A very interesting model. But um, yeah, it, it, if you're there for the networking opportunities, it's certainly not something that uh, it will work for that. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind, it's sometime today, or if if not, while we're, we're chatting, feel free to, to do it on the side. I don't mind um, double tasking. And uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind filling out that, that survey. As I said, I'll come out in a link later today to, um, to our members. Visas. Um, if you watched my little check-in yesterday on social media, uh, I alluded to the fact that we're working with Business New South Wales, which is the old chamber of uh, New South Wales Business Chamber. And uh, visas is certainly something that, uh, from a tourism perspective, they've done a lot of work in lobbying and, and working with the government on. And uh, they didn't realise when I mentioned it that the outdoor sector has a considerable amount of, of visa uh, employees as well. I really want to ask openly, and please feel free to show your, your faces and, and unmute yourself, who has employed people with, with visas or visa holders um, in the past? Obviously, you don't have too many at the moment, I, I'm guessing, but who has actually had people that uh, you've employed that have had visas? Never mill. Okay, cool. Yep. Oh, you have? Yeah. Oh, yeah. brilliant. Can you tell me a little bit, Helen, a, a little bit about some, some of the challenges that you faced? Um, challenges before our global pandemic um, or challenges now? Yeah, sorry, before global, <laughs> before the, the pandemic. That'd be great. Thanks. Um, yeah, challenges are around maintaining our understanding of rapid changes with the immigration. Yep. Um, so Australian immigration changing the rules relatively regularly and us needing to stay on top of that. Yep. Um, other challenges have been meeting the criteria. So when we transition from uh, one visa to another, how, how we go about meeting the criteria. Yes. And the most recent um, changes have been around being able to extend um, a visa after farm work and the criteria for that being um, quite difficult to actually um, meet Brilliant. Um, especially when it's around yeah engaging young Australians and having an impact um, yeah it's been right. quite difficult I, I sort of was hoping that well I wasn't hoping you were going to have problems but I, I was thinking that that was exactly one of the challenges that we might be facing so thank you for that and sorry for anyone that doesn't know Helen you don't mind me telling everyone where you're from <laughs> um, Helen's from OEG so um, yeah obviously a large contributor to to the sector um, anyone else that's employed um, any visa holders? Uh, oh, Sam, you have? Have you had any other issues? Or oh, Brad, have you had any other issues more than what Helen's had? Well, nothing, nothing more than what Helen's had. Obviously, the issue with farm work. Yep. Is it, but it also comes on what time of year they've actually come in. So they've come in in a time of year where there's not a lot of farm work necessarily going on, uh, then necessarily that's hard for them to be able to get that second year extension. The other also thing is with the visa conditions is they're only on a working holiday, they're only supposed to stay in one spot for no longer than six months. Yep. So it's not a case of they'd be there for three months, then go do their farm work and then come back for another three months it's quite tricky to try and work around that because you put the training into the person to make sure that they're appropriate for your site and then you only got a very very limited time with them yes and you just spend your time sort of living in a gray area when you have these the people in that aspect yeah yeah absolutely no that's a really good point um and the six months is that uh, i'm going to assume that there's some seasonality issues around some of this as well 
like seasonal well, the main thing might only be three months for some see the the seasonality aspect is it because we normally do do inductions in yeah, january and or july so it's just based on where our peak seasons are but once someone goes off on their farm work there's still no guarantee that they'll necessarily be returning so you still don't have a guarantee of that employee until yeah. such time as they knock back on your door mm. to say they're back but you understand the purpose of the working holiday visa is so they actually do work and holiday and aren't taking particular roles in particular areas mm. but i also believe that the definition for farm work and the I think it is the legislated postcodes because it's black and white in a legislative instrument what's defined as regional and rural. And yeah. for example, where we are, as far as, for example, tea gardens, uh, our postcode extends all the way down to nearly Newcastle, all the way up to here. So we're considered as not necessarily regional, but one suburb across from us is. Right, right. It's okay. the fact that they're that black and white legislative instrument that defines their regional areas, yeah. I think needs a bit more of a review. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. That's a really good piece of content because I, I hadn't thought of that, but it's a continual argument that I have uh, around what's regional, what's not. Um, okay, no, that's brilliant. Thank you, Brad. That's that's great. If um, Are you guys okay if I maybe contact you a bit later if I've got more questions on that? Yeah, no worries. You want to shoot me an email? That'll be fine. Great. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Helen. That's awesome. Um, Sam, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, not in particular. Um, I'm on Brian's computer oh, with the, the muting. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it varies for us um, depending on the age that we're taking people. Um, and it, the, the visas seem to change pretty quick. So, so just keeping up with um, uh, the legislation is, is, is half the challenge. That, that, that fits the person that we're interested in. Um, yeah. It just seems to change every year that um, I feel like we're starting from scratch each time. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point as well. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Sam. But ours are definitely uh, for seasonal um, seasonal work. And how, how long do you employ your guys for? Uh, between three and six months. Okay. Cool. Uh, in the past, we've done nine months, um, but that's, that's not something we'll continue to do. Yeah. Okay. No, good to know. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. If anyone else has any thoughts um, on, on visas, please reach out and let me know as I start collating some of this content to give to, to Business New South Wales and see if we can't get some consideration for our sector in, in the changes that they're, uh, they're looking at. And hopefully we'll stop changing the regulations every year and starting from scratch, as Sam said. But uh, yeah, let's try to improve it so we, we have access to, to what we need. Um, fabulous. I've got a, um, an amazing person that's volunteered to help us today, um, Cameron. Cameron, you're on the line. I did see you there earlier. Cameron Jones. Not Cameron from Equipped. <laughs> um, you're yes. also amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so thanks, Cameron. Um, you come to us from Queensland with Dom and, and thank you for joining us today. I have spoken to a lot of people that are a little bit apprehensive about to four and try to get ready and um, and make sure that they're, they're well equipped to, to combat whatever onslaught they're expecting. So I just wanted to ask you if you wouldn't mind sharing with us your journey and how um, when you started to resume back to camp, some of the things that you were challenged with and potentially anything you want to share with, with New South Wales and ACT. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I think um, the challenges, you know, it's on, on many levels. You know, firstly, it was getting um, getting the staff ready, um, getting the team across COVID, the risks around COVID, um, the and compliance with the industry plan. So up here in Queensland, we have. Um, an industry plan that we have to follow and that also means there's a number of um, documents and planning documents that we needed to produce as a business for we've got a venue on the gold and sunshine coast so it was firstly getting those documents in order then training the staff and then there was also a bit of a cultural piece especially because there's a lot of fear mm. um, so especially for our program delivery staff um, you know, who are seen as on the front line, you know, they've got to go in close at times with clients to, to um, you know, get them safe and ready for activities. So there's a, a lot of time spent around that. Um, and then there's 
uh, a lot of work that we put into education for our clients um, so that they felt it was safe to come to camp as well. So, you know, enhanced cleaning and hygiene guidelines, uh, a lot of um, uh, email and communication messaging risk assessments, um, standard operating procedures that we were updating and sending to them so that they felt comfortable and they understood the arrangements that we were trying to work under. Because um, <clears throat> up here in Queensland, the schools were largely left uh, unaffected in the way they operate. So for them to then come into a place that has a lot of restrictions, it was hard for them to understand around social distancing. Yeah. So there's a lot of communication there with schools as well. Are you still having problems with that, with social distancing? Uh, no, it, it, it varies. It's quite good. I think a lot of people are understanding now and, and schools are. Um, we are still having some challenges up here, especially around um, currently we have group limits, uh, which restrict group sizes to 100. Mm -hmm. So if we get a group, we get a school come in with 120 students, we need to split them in half um, and they can never see each other whilst they're on camp. So it provides challenges because like the um, teachers also have to split and can't see each other and co-mingle. Mm. Um, so that's been the most difficult part of it. Uh, but we've been working with um, Dom and Outdoor Queensland uh, recently to try and lobby to get that um, reviewed by the Chief Health Officer, which I think um, is in train at the moment. So. Mm. Wonderful. We're waiting on a decision from our Chief Health Officer on that one and uh, yeah, it's just once they get a chance, um, yeah, see what happens. Mm. Awesome. Well, so, well, haven't they just changed it to have stand-up beers at a pub from 4pm today now, Dom? So they're sure they should be able to let kids in? <laughs> I've just seen that, mate. They've just released a quite an interesting um, new roadmap with, that goes right through to... Um, stage six now, which we haven't seen before. But one of the things that's very reliant on you, New South Welshmen doing the right thing and not having any community transmission, and then we can relax more and let more of you guys up here. So that's quite interesting. But um, yeah, I've only just seen that this morning. So well, we are the centre of the universe, Dom, so. <laughs> so you think. I think we're just doing it so you guys can come up and what and say you can come up to the state of origin and watch yourselves get flogged again. <laughs> Yeah, we won't go there. <laughs> Sorry, back to outdoors. The, the real stuff. Um, yeah, I guess the other one, the, the, the 100 limit has been a real challenge, I think. Mm. But the, the things that Cameron just touched on about the communication with clients, I think that's been a thing that a lot of people have said to me that, you know, a lot of the schools are super keen to come back, but then they also need to communicate to the parents and the kids what to expect and also to their staff. So the teachers who are coming to camp with those with with the with the school group, that's one that I know that a lot of schools had to work with their staff to understand what to expect as soon as they got to camp. Um, and I think that was a that was a real process that some of our operators have done really, really well as far as communicating those sort of things. I think yeah. Cameron and his team have certainly done a good job of that and so have a lot of other operators. Yeah. Yeah. So really, some of the key things from a business sense that we've seen is like the restrictions are there and, and you know, they, they, they've, it's great because they've enabled us to get going again, you know, and, um, <clears throat> you know, which has been fantastic. Mm. Um, but they do add another layer to your business, mm. you know, in terms of the levels of cleaning that you need to undertake, uh, the amount of staffing required to successfully deliver a a program, a camp, has actually increased as a result of the, the distancing requirements because at the moment instructors cannot move between group, say, group A and group B. Mm. They always have to remain with group A. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, and then the amount of time it takes to do things. Mm. So if I have to, I have a group come through the dining hall, I have to do a full clean before another group comes through the dining hall. So that's additional cleaning, but also additional time I need to factor into a meal service. Mm -hmm. um, so they're the things I'd say prepare for, yeah. that your, your traditional program uh, that you've delivered may need modification in a, just a number of areas in terms of staffing, time frames of delivery, uh, and then the cleaning, mm -hmm. um, to undertake cleaning 
yeah. uh, takes longer. Right. Yeah, no, I can't remember. <clears throat> a couple of conversations I've had with our guys this week, it's like uh, we've got to stop thinking we're going to go back to what we had. Um, you know, that that's the end. <laughs> we're, we're, we're drawing the line. This is a new world. We're, we're in now in a very different world. So we've got to recreate models. We've got to recreate our understanding of our business and recreate um, where our profit margin <laughs> is, is going to come from. So it's a really good point that you make. How, um, how you mentioned before getting your staff on board with, um, I suppose, uh, understanding the risks and, and that type of thing. Anything out of that from a conversational aspect or tools that you put in place helped you engage with your staff any anymore? Yeah, what we, what we really did was narrow in on the, the health advice, the official health advice from our chief medical officer. And that's all of that advice and all that information that came from um, Queensland Health and the, and the chief medical officer is what we used to drive our risk assessments our standard operating procedures. The biggest thing you have in terms of fear with the um, with your staff is the amount of misinformation that actually is out there. Mm -hmm. Some other links that we went to was to engage with our public health units. Our, we have local public health units. We actually got them out and brought them into the venues to have a walk around, have a look at all of our documentation and do a bit of an audit for us. Now, it was, you know, that was a way to be proactive so that we could be ensuring uh, that we're following the right protocols and we were complying with the, the directive. Mm. But it was also another way where we could say to the staff, hey, we've done all this work. Um, we've engaged with the public health unit who have independently checked everything we're doing. Uh, we actually gave all of our stuff over to Dom to have a look as well um, and invited him to those. Um, so it was, we could also say, hey, Outdoors, uh, Queens, uh, outdoors Queensland mm. have reviewed our documents. So we're doing everything possible to ensure the safest work environment yeah. for our team. Mm. Mm. And that instills a bit of confidence with your team. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And how did you go sorry. with the client? Oh, sorry, Dom, yeah, go for it. I was just going to say on that, those site visits were really valuable. A few other operators have done it as well, exactly the same, partly because the rec centres led the way with that. But what it's done is it's let the centres actually ask the experts when you're there questions. And some of the things I noticed when we were at that session, there were a couple of questions from staff and the, the public health people had never even considered some bits. And there were some things they said straight away, like um, if there's someone at your centre, touch where it doesn't happen. But if there's someone there who is exhibiting symptoms of COVID, yeah. What happens with the rest of the crew? Is it okay to continue with the program? And the, the public health guy at one of them, I think it was at the Gold Coast one, Cam, he just said straight away, well, no, he, those kids, you know, they're not going to have it. They, even if they've just had contact with someone who's, who's potentially got COVID, they're not going to actually have it for a while. It takes a while to develop in their system. So it's fine for them to keep going with the, with the camp for the next couple of days. Like he was quite open about yeah. that he said yeah you don't just because one person there has symptoms yeah. doesn't mean you have to shut the whole show down he yeah. said he said you know, just send everyone to go and wash their hands yeah that was his advice get them to wash their hands and mm. get, and, get, and then go back to business you know that was <laughs> and that was i think i just saw everyone in the room just take a little breath right then of okay you know because we're all you know there's that fear that it that is very serious but it was an interesting thing for that to come, not from, I think, Cameron or one of the other um, parts of the management, but it was coming from a public health guy and the staff all heard it firsthand and said, so we're all sitting there going, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, it was though a good session for those, um, the, the public health units. So I'm not sure if New South Wales public health units are open to the same thing but if they are i'd recommend just at least contact them. Yeah, yeah i think that's that's great um yeah i'll find out because that i'm sure looking around here there'd be quite a few people that wouldn't mind taking that up i guess is that would that be correct if anyone wants to speak up we'll put a thumbs up <laughs> um yeah i'll ask the question yeah, sorry it's mark yeah. yeah mark yeah i just spoke to the um national hotline this morning about exactly the same thing right and, and what did they say exactly the same thing that dom just said 
So that was from the national hotline that just because somebody's exhibiting the symptoms doesn't mean that everybody else has to stop. You can continue going until you get told that they're positive. Yeah, brilliant. Um, you probably didn't ask the question, are, are they um, happy to, to do site visits? Uh, no, I didn't. I was running it from the point of view that um, we were looking at a tour next year in Queensland, uh, which is going between Cairns and Corumba, and there's only testing stations at Atherton and Georgetown at the moment. Right. So I was wanting to run this scenario if I've got somebody at 150 kilometres from a testing station, what happens and what's my responsibilities in getting people wow. um, there? And uh, that's the confusing bit. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, because what you end up with, sorry, what you sorry. end up with is a situation that I found is that we could drive somebody back to get tested, but because you're in the vehicle for an hour and a half, you it wasn't clear, even if you're wearing masks and got the windows open and everything else like that, it was not clear whether you would then become called a uh, close contact. Um, so, uh, right. So, so I noticed Cameron's nodding there. So I'd be interested in his response on that. Yeah, it, that's been part of um, part of a key part of our planning is actually having to communicate with clients that if they have a child who starts displaying symptoms, or, or someone coming to camp that has it is is displaying symptoms that they're going to have to have a way to get them home. Um, so we'll isolate them on site and we're providing, a, a, we keep an isolation bedroom. So one room sort of free for, for isolation purposes. Uh, and then there has to be a plan for getting people home. And that could be very difficult, like Mark, in your situation, um, you know, but when the public health unit were here, he did provide an example where he said, um, he, he was transporting people with COVID in his car, no problem, with windows down and a mask on and putting them in the back seat on the opposite corner of the car. And he'd done that on a number of occasions without fear or favour. And once they got out, he did a, a clean, you know, Glen 20 or other chemicals that kill the, the virus. He would just clean the car out and move on. Mm. So, yeah, he said actually well, outside of the body, it's quite hard to, um, it's quite easy to kill. Right. So if you took those precautions and wash your hands and then most on the most part you're fine. Right. right. It was it was surprising how yeah, how not casual, but how matter of fact they were about that part of it as far as we'll drive them to the nearest testing center. It's a bit different, I guess, Mark, when you're talking 150 Ks away, um, and you could be in the car for a couple of hours. Mm. Um, but even at that same session, um, the one the Gold Coast, there's also next door, there's a, or in the same site, there's another, the beach school, which is run by the Department of Education. And they were, they had a camping of a group of students from Mount Isa. So that's only about 2,000 kilometres away. And if one of those kids exhibited symptoms, there's one thing to go and get them tested, but the next question is, how do you get them home? Mm. You know, like, what's the story? You can't really just go plonk them on a plane and send them home. So, yeah, um, yeah that, they were talking about that exact situation as well. And they, for their parents to get there, it's not quite as simple as if it's, you know, an hour's drive or whatever. So there's certainly a lot of logistical uh, issues, particularly when there's schools from rural and remote areas coming, traveling a long way to go to, go to the camp, which yeah. uh, does happen quite often for us. Mm. And, and would for New South Wales too. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Mm. Really great stuff. Cam, I'm not sure I'm following your comment there. Cameron from Equipped. Uh, are you there? <laughs> you got your mic on today, Cam? Yep. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, Cam. Um, yes, yeah, so we just had some Queensland camps who were running day only programs. In other words, the students were going home each night. Um, and um, they had a student not attend the camp, which was sort of presumed to be a school admin issue. Uh, it was only later in conversation that they found out that this child would had, um, you know, flu-like symptoms. Um, and that was the reason for not attendance on that day. Right. So, um, so I'm not following what, um, what you're saying there. I think I missed a little bit, but you, what you're saying is that there's the students are not to attend if they've got flu-like symptoms. 
So yeah. the, the fact was they'd actually um, already been to camp and yep. they didn't turn up on one of the days because of flu-like symptoms without having triggered any alarms for, um, you know, oh. their temperature or anything else. Gotcha. So that, that goes back to, Cameron, it goes back, I think it goes back to the declaration that you have for your attendees. And I, I get, it's probably a situation of do you do that declaration every single day or do you do one at the start of the week and if they're turning up just daily during the week, not as an overnight system, then potentially you could have that system where a kid doesn't turn up on Tuesday but is there Monday and comes back Wednesday and, and you don't even know why they didn't come on Tuesday, the fact that it was flu-like symptoms. And yeah, that's a difficult one, I think, as far as how you manage that. Yeah. We've taken the approach of um, day programs. It's a declaration each time you attend. Uh, for a camp, if they stay and they remain residential, then it's the one declaration prior to arrival at the venue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Anyone got any questions for, for Cameron? Um, or well, Cameron from McQuish, but Cameron Jones, <laughs> uh, in relation to, to what he's been doing. I, I just want to ask one question as people are thinking if they've got questions. Cam, um, with the staff, and uh, I, I heard from a couple of Don's other members that they really were overwhelmed with bookings as soon as camps resumed and that they're, they're now struggling with burnout um, because they can't get staff and, and they're trying to get staff back. Um, and it's something that a couple of our members have raised to us is we can't get them back. You know, they're, they're gone or what have you done in, in that area? Um, and, and yeah, have you come up with a golden chalice solution? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, no. We, we were lucky. We did retain a number of our casual staff through the shutdown um, and took the opportunity to pretty much rewrite all of our program delivery material, risk assessments, training materials, um, and uh, standard operating procedures. So we divvied out enough work to get us through that time. Uh, we have lost a number though still, I think um, probably nearly 15 to 20 um, staff we've lost. Um, and it's two, there's two challenges of the, even the casuals we still have left. Um, you know, whilst there's the job um, keeper or job seeker and the amounts that it was, we've also got those that'll work maybe two to three days, but then reduce their total hours so they can be receive the additional funding through the job uh, seeker, yeah. the job keeper, whichever one. Um, so we've got them making those sort of decisions on yeah. which way is their pack, pay packet going to be higher. Um, however, in terms of demand, um, yeah, there's the, if there's one thing I'd say based off our experience is expect it only to go up, not down. Um, the hardest part, given your social distancing restrictions, like um, our capacity to deliver is, you know, we're 480 beds on the Gold Coast and 318 on the Sunshine Coast, but really we can't deliver to more than 200 mm. given our current operating restrictions. Uh, so that's meant we are at full, full noise every week since. And then this school holiday period, a real, a real um, eye-opener for us has been the popularity of doing school holiday programs, given the amount of now domestic tourism mm. and uh, people staying at home and not travelling abroad. Uh, they're looking for things to do. Right. So our numbers this school holidays have been the highest we've ever had. Um, ever in the history of running our school holiday activities. So I would say be prepared for that, um, you know, and yeah, yeah it, the staffing thing won't go away though. It's, it's, it's ongoing for us. We're, sorry, we're the other, for sorry, Kent, the other one on the staffing is the staff are loud and clear hearing the message of if you have any symptoms, don't turn up. So, yeah. and they, that, that's responsible. But the other part of that is that could happen at seven o'clock in the morning mm. and the centre, if they're going to run your busiest period, holiday period ever, you need enough staff there and you need staff on call to cover that. And that's, I think that's one challenge that quite a few operators have mentioned to me in the last few weeks. So, mm. And it, it's 
staff doing the right thing. There's no doubt about that. It's not, there's no suggestion they're, you know, working the system that they're going and getting a COVID test just because they feel like having a couple of days off. I don't think that's happening, but yeah, um, yeah that's a big one too as far as staff and staff availability. Yeah, yeah. right. And how have you gone with with that exact issue on rostering? Are you ca are you trying to counteract that by having more rostered on? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's what we've we've done, and we're just got, we're constantly recruiting. Mm. Yep, because it's the amount of time it takes to train someone mm. uh, as well. Even it's not as simple as just going and and getting a new employee. Mm. You know, there's there's qualifications and upskilling and ensuring they deliver to the standards that you set as a business so there's lead times in having someone that can just enter the field and deliver successfully yeah so yeah we're just on a constant recruitment drive now at the moment because mm -hmm. of the because of that and it is it's like leaving two staff up your sleeve uh, who you can pull off the bench to get to, to jump into the field if you need it yeah 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 does anyone have any specific questions for Cameron while we've got him here because I know all of you are busy trying to get ready and, and work out what you can and can't do. I, I noticed um, Mel's asked a copy. Is anyone willing to share their declaration form that they ask their attendees? Because um, Mel would love to, to see what other people are doing. I think there's one in the um, in our plan, in the, in the approved plan. It's at least got the um, the framework of what it should have, at least in Queensland. Um, you know, it talks about have you been overseas in the last in the last fourteen days? You've been overseas. Have you been in a declared hotspot? Have you got any uh, any symptoms of COVID nineteen? Those sort of things. Um, right. But yeah, I'm sure someone would have a specific form that they could share. Um, I can well. you say that I do remember seeing that, Dom. So yeah, Mel, I can send. You if you haven't already got that. Um, is that is that in the course? In the COF plan, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I do have that. Okay. Have a look see, at that. One thing. I'll see if I can do another one. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, Laurie. You're right, one right? thing that is quite easy to do is if you have a look at the New South Wales or the Service New South Wales app they want you to use, have a look at what their what their mm -hmm. questions are and check oh, in with their QR right. codes. Yeah. That, that'll give you a very good one. But the one that I found was very good is when checking in for the AFL, for the kids' sport, is instead of using the term hotspots, they use the, the get checked and self-isolate list on the New South Wales Health website because New South Wales Health is particular about they don't declare hotspots. They've just got areas where you need to self-isolate. So if you're using that type of wording instead of hotspots because that's obsolete wording nowadays, Yep, that's a good point. Too. Is one of the better is one of the better options to go with. Yep. I see that the question in the ops manual um, with suspected cases, and one thing we've done is a bit of a flowchart for staff, and we send it to clients as well, and we talk around that as well. It's what we'll do is if because kids get sick on camp, there's nothing surer. You'll have your first camp in, there'll be a kid that's sick. So mm -hmm. what we do is then enter into a, is it a likely case or ha unlikely case wow. and we ask those questions have they come from a high risk area or have they come from an area of no cases wow. and 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 we ask okay ask the child have you been anywhere where you may have been in contact and we just ask a couple extra probing questions to determine if there's any likelihood and then at that point in time if they're not displaying a number of symptoms and they haven't come from somewhere that's likely then it's more like a, we monitor wow. and if they improve overnight or something you know, we isolate still, but monitor, and then, but if it is more heading towards a likely, then we'll isolate and they, they get sent home. Yeah, um, brilliant. Okay, no, that's really good. And thanks, Mark, for sharing yours. Mel, there's one as well that Mark's um, from Mulga's shared with you. Um, you've got a couple more questions, Cameron, if you don't mind. How have you found yeah. enforcing screening health declarations before the students actually get on the bus? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was it was a it was a challenge because even um, with our schools when we first began, we had to collect all the details of every child. So that meant every parent's phone number and email address. So schools are not usually quite happy releasing that extra level of information, um, given privacy. <laughs> um, 
So that was, we don't have to do that now. We just have to work with the school to ensure they have that information and can mm. provide it on, uh, they have to declare that they, they have to provide us two contacts who can provide Queensland Health with that information within one hour. So that's been one of the improvements that we've been able to um, uh, improve our industry plan on through. The, so that's been quite helpful. Yeah. And then those two people are de declaring um, those three questions on, on behalf of the rest of the people who come to camp. Right. So uh, when you put it on someone and, uh, that it's their responsibility, they, they generally um, will do that pretty, um, they'll take that seriously. Okay, good advice. Um, Helen's just asked, have you created any relationships with other providers in terms of staff sharing? Um, or, you know, obviously there could be some options of rosters <laughs> um, colliding. Yeah, has there any been... Any we haven't we haven't because what we can do I have the luxury I can send staff from the Gold Coast up to my Sunshine Coast venue and vice versa mm -hmm. um, and then we do have some local relationships with local contract providers yeah. like surf contractors or canoe co canoeing contractors so mm. they've been able to get through it using a range of those options mm. Mm. Well, that's a, a good final has, has there been any examples of anyone looking at um, other industries and um, potentially... If someone... If yeah. Sorry, I'm just... Someone can yeah. speak? No? Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, any examples of any other industries that you've, you've worked in, to tr uh, worked with to try to... I mean, obviously, there's not a lot of fruit pickers out there at the moment, but is there any other industries that we could look at to, to address this issue? Yeah, the biggest drama, Laurie, is always the qualifications as far as what anyone can actually do. Particularly, it, it sort of depends on who, who calls in sick, really. But if you're looking at, um, you know, particularly your ratios as far as leaders to uh, participants, those sort of things, it's not like you can just plug the gap with, um, with anyone. So, And a lot of the time, as Cameron said before, they need training in that, at that site or in your prayer processes. So... It's yeah. a hard one to fill at a short at short notice, um, but you know, obviously, there is opportunities there. But yeah, it is a difficult one as far as trying to expand that pool of uh, potential employees, um, uh, particularly at the moment in the economic uh, situation that a lot of businesses are in. It's pretty hard to go out there and just go recruiting just in case. You know, it's. Um, that that's been a real difficult thing, I think, for a lot of operators. So, mm. yeah, yeah, that's that's one hundred percent right. We, we were very gun shy to begin with on ramping up too quickly, and then an out, you know we did have a couple of outbreaks um, as a result of a a couple of lovely people visiting Victoria. <laughs> um, that resulted in us. It was a very it was a weekly watch and see. Um, given if that was to continue and we had some schools coming from those areas so that was like a flare-up and uh, we almost we almost stumbled but we were able to get through it you know very luckily you know because it could could have it could be in very much the same situation as Victoria and New South, and New South Wales right now yeah absolutely and I think if I can reiterate you know we've just got to try to do as much as we can to to make sure we are not the next cluster, the next transmission. Um, I, I think it was Dom that said, we don't want to be the next cruise line. <laughs> we, you know, we've got to make sure that we prevent being branded um, with, with risk. Mm. Thank you so much, Cameron. Really appreciate your time. And Dom, thanks again for coming. I know you've got a rush because you've got your session now. So um, I'll, I'll let you guys go, but thank you so much for, for joining us. And if anyone thinks of any other questions, I'm sure I can email Cameron and, and ask him um, for some advice. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Cam. Thanks, guys. Uh, with five minutes left, I just wanted to open it up and just um, ask anyone if they wanted to um, pinpoint something that they're, they're finding as they start res getting back to, to full steam um, or anything that they see as an opportunity for the sector that they just wanted to bring forward and, and discuss or any comment on the session we've just had as well, because I think it's mm -hmm. timely that we try to look at these issues. Just one thing from me, Laurie. 
Yeah, Brad. Is do you believe that you will be having any further conversation with New South Wales Health regarding oh. the COVID safe plan that you've put in place? Do you think we've just been told these are the rules of engagement, you sort it out for yourself? Yeah, no, look, I, I would hope that the conversation will continue not only um, when we're full steam ongoing now. I mean, one thing that we've certainly learnt through this process is that our relationships with those key policymakers, regardless of time of year and time of epidemic, is, is crucially important on an ongoing basis. We should have them as part of our business every day. Um, but the conversation regarding our COVID plan, I still want to continue because I think it gives clarity to the sector. Um, at the moment, it's like, well, do I sit in that camp or do I sit in that camp and do I follow that rule or do I follow that rule? Uh, the more um, that we have a outdoor activity COVID plan, the simpler it is for you guys to, to look at. And obviously when we scale back and the restrictions start um, being eased too, there's clarity on what the conditions are around that. So I definitely want to continue those conversations. At the moment, I think purely because of workload, um, if I can say that on their behalf, because I know they're really swamped, is um, they're pushing us to the ones that they've already got there. So my recommendation to everyone right now is to look at both of those and see where your business best fits and pull those recommendations off those two plans for the time being. Um, but the hope is, Brad, that we do continue that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mel, did you have a question? No worries. Yeah, I just wanted to say, yeah, I would really love to get a plan from New South Wales because mm. I just find it quite overwhelming mm. that we don't have, you know, those two plans that we're recommended to use really don't have mm. a lot in them as far as us, you know, with detail, like you said, clarity. Correct, yeah. I'd like to have more clarity because, yeah, it, yeah it's kind of... Well, you're There's a perfect like, example that you you actually fit into both of those plans. So how do you make them <laughs> like six plans because yeah. of our business? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 But I found with um, what we've been recommended to for the for outdoor ed for school camps is mm. really not not good enough, mm. and and it does leave you wondering. Like this session's been really good because it's answered quite a lot of questions for me. Awesome. Um, but it's also a bit overwhelming because it's like, oh, I didn't know that or, yeah, you know, if I hadn't have watched this today, I wouldn't have known some of those, those things that were talked about today. Yeah, correct. And, and as I said, some of the discussions I've had with a lot of our operators, uh, they, they feel like they're starting the business again. You know, they're mm. starting from scratch. And, and it's true because you're having to relook at everything very differently uh, in a very mm circumstance of course but yeah it's um it is overwhelming and that's why we're trying to provide the tools and the information as much as we physically can so you can make the right informed choices for your business um mm. but yeah that's yeah. um that's a really good point mm. anyway thank you it's been good pleasure no worries Mel. thank you um anyone else want to say anything because we're up to 10 59 and god we're good with time <laughs> No? Okay, great, guys. Well, thank you again for joining us for another Connect and Share. Um, next week, um, we are going to break up into sessions on some very specific topics. So I really want to get a feeling from, from everyone and the members around 2021 now. We've got to, as much as you guys are working on your day-to-day, -day, I want to spend next Friday at 10 o'clock thinking about 2021. Because if we're going to be the peak body you need, we need to be ready and armed um, to help you combat what's going to come in 2021 and also take advantage of some of the opportunities that, that presents. So without further ado, I will let you all go on to your day and uh, wish you all a fabulous weekend and next week. And we'll see you next Friday at 10 o'clock. Thanks all. <laughs>